Dear family and friends in Christ, united together by our Holy Spirit, may God richly and daily bless you. May His grace, mercy, and peace dwell with you. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the gift of your Holy Spirit, who lives and dwells, who breathes through each of us and moves in our lives in ways that we do not often see. Help us each day to know that He is moving to bring us closer to you, moving in our lives that our hearts may burn with a passion for you. May we often hear, that, Lord, hear you, O Lord, speaking to us, guiding us, and directing us, that one day we may join you in the life eternal. This we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. There's a popular idiom that probably, if not all of you, most of you know, all talk and no action. Maybe you've said that about someone yourself. Heard that said about someone. Maybe even if you have not said it, you've witnessed it. For instance, how many of us talk about politicians this way? All talk and no action. That senator, she said she was going to do this, this, and this as soon as she got elected. Where is the action? Or how about a coworker who tells you that he's going to confront the boss and he's going to tell him that no more overtime and yet never has the courage to stand up to that coworker? The young woman in your life who tells you that she's ready to lose weight, she needs to lose weight, and she has another Oreo. All talk, no action. We all, thinking about our lives, thinking about the lives of those around us, are familiar with this idiom. Now, it's not a new idiom. In fact, the, they can trace it back to about 1607 in John Ray's Proverbs. John Ray wrote, The greatest talkers are always the least doers. Pretty close, isn't it? All talk and no action. One has to wonder if this truth at one time or another was also said about the church. Certainly it is said about the church today in many cases, isn't it? Many people talk about the church, talk about the people of the church, and they talk about the way the church supports the poor or doesn't, those in need, or they don't. They talk about it, but do they do it? They talk about the way the church stands up for the unborn, those who, are not, who do not have a voice, or do they? Is it all talk? And no action. The world loves to point the finger at the church for its hypocrisy. The way we talk about living holy lives. Lives governed by the Lord. Lives that are reflective of Jesus Christ. But they point out our hypocrisy. That oftentimes our lives are no different than others. All talk. And no action. And maybe that's something for us to think about. That our faith is meant to be something more than talked about. That our faith is meant to be something more than words of loan. In fact, if we go to James chapter 2, and I know I'm getting on a little uncomfortable Lutheran ground here because we don't like to go to James at all, and much less James 2, but James 2.17, James says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. An uncomfortable but familiar text, isn't it? Because we do know the truth that our faith is meant to not only be words alone, but it is meant to be action. We are meant to live out our faith in everything we say, in the way that we love one another, the way that we treat one another, even the way we talk to one another. But how often is that true? Now, lest your Lutheran alarm bells are going off, I'm not saying we're saved by those works. We are saved by Jesus Christ and Him alone, Christ crucified on the cross, delivered from our sins. But as the saved people of God, we have been called to share His love, to reflect His love, to live out His love. And don't take my word for it. Let's look at 1 John chapter 4. The Lord speaks through John. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. Very clear words from John. We're meant to love as God first loved us. We're meant to care for others as God cares for us. People are meant to see God in our actions, 
hear God in our words, experience God in our interactions with them. So the question I ask you is why don't they? Why don't people always see God in our lives? Why don't people always hear God in our words or experience God in our action, in our interactions? Why is it in our lives that so often we are all talk and no action? As I pondered this and I thought about this, I knew that the answers for each of you might be different. But I wondered what it could be. I wondered at first, that maybe it's the fact that, is it, is it the fact that we're waiting for a whisper in our ear? A tap on our shoulder. Something concrete that we can say, God sent me to do this, to care for this person. After all, we look at Scripture and we see how God worked through Paul and on the road to Damascus, or how he specifically sent the disciples. Are we waiting for the same thing? For that concrete evidence that God is sending you, sending me? Maybe. Or maybe maybe it's that we're not sure what to do if we were sent. Maybe we wonder if, if maybe if we were sent to somebody, put in a person's life, we wouldn't know what to say. And so we'd rather just avoid it. I wondered if maybe apathy comes up. We're comfortable. We're content. We know that our salvation is secure because we know where our faith is placed, that Christ has given us a promise of eternal life. And so we don't worry about other people. We don't worry about if our neighbor next to us knows the Lord as their Savior. We don't wonder if our family members, if they truly believe. Or perhaps it's something more than that. Whether it be those three or anything else that you thought about on your heart, doesn't it ultimately come back to our relationship with God? Doesn't it ultimately come back to the way that we see our lives as shaped and formed by God, the way that God moves in our lives? And maybe sometimes we struggle to see the way he is working. He doesn't work in the same way he did, or at least we don't recognize it, do we? We don't always recognize, for instance, in the Old Testament, he brought his people safely from great armies against them. In the New Testament, Jesus did so many miracles that it changed hearts and lives. But oftentimes we don't see those today, do we? We don't recognize the way that God could be working. And I wonder if this has an impact on us. Maybe at times, well, we might not ever utter these words. We wonder to ourselves, is God a God of action or not? Is he all promise and no action? After all, how many of you have knelt down in prayer? And I don't mean just a a passing prayer, but you knelt down in prayer. You went to the Lord and you bore your soul before him. But nothing changed. And so you got down on your knees again. You prayed and you prayed. Your knees ached. Your heart was broken. The tears stained your face. But nothing changed. How many of you have known someone, maybe even in your own family, they got the diagnosis of the tumor? And you prayed and you prayed and you prayed that the tumor would be benign, that that they would cut into it and it would be benign. And then their organs shut down as the cancer got to each of them. And you stood by their side as they breathed their last ragged breath. Nothing changed. How many of you have prayed for your marriages? Prayed for marriages of your loved ones as they struggled, as they fought, as as even though they tried to keep things under wraps, as you tried to hide things and keep things under wraps, you knew that there was boiling beneath the surface. And then the papers were served and the signature signed. Or how many of you, loving your children, your family, wanted to put a house, a roof over their heads? That's all you asked for. That's all you desired. But all you have left are are boxes and a broken cracked sign that says home sweet home how many of us have been through a a terrible 
trial in our lives. And all we've prayed for is that God would just give us a glimmer of hope. He would just give us a small picture of light in our darkness. We prayed that he would just open our eyes just a little so we could see that he is still with us. And yet, the, the more we went through it, the darker things got. Instead of uh, going to hope, we turned to despair. How many of us have wondered whether God is indeed acting and working in our lives? Oh no, as good Christian people, we wouldn't say those words. We might even chastise ourselves if we thought about them in our minds, in our hearts. But we know in our heart of hearts that more than one time our hearts have expelled those very groans, those questions, God, are you there? Where is your promise now? Why aren't you acting? And so we turn not to ourselves, not to what we know, but we turn to the Word of God and we turn to the words of Paul because in the words of Paul, he answers us in that very time of need. In those words of Paul that we read this very day from Romans chapter 8, we see words of hope and comfort that are meant to speak to people who are going through broken times and broken relationships and broken lives. We read from Romans 8 and we realize that we are not alone. But we have an advocate, and that is the Holy Spirit, who hears our prayers, who answers our prayers, who does not leave us abandoned as children on this earth, but as sons and daughters of God. And I encourage you for a moment to go back with me in history. I encourage you for a moment to go back to the very setting which Paul wrote these words. Because so often we get consumed by our own trials. We get consumed by our own brokenness. But I want to take you back to the original context that Paul wrote those words. The church in Rome, it was in the center of the Roman Empire. The, the, the very center of commerce. And Paul was writing these words to a church that was about to experience persecution such that we cannot imagine. They were about to experience persecution like we cannot even fathom. They were going to be abandoned by their family, by their friends, by those they loved and cared about. They were going to be burned, and they were going to be bruised, and they were going to be beaten, and they were going to be buried. And they would go into the Colosseum and they would stand in the Colosseum. And they would be mauled and they would be jeered at and laughed at. All because they believed in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. But Paul didn't want that church to be alone. Paul didn't want that Roman church to think that God had forgotten them, that He had abandoned them. And so he wrote these words so that they would know that even in the midst of those trials, God hears them. That God hears the very wails of His creation as it wails as if in the pains of childbirth. That God hears the unborn child in the womb. That God hears the, the woman laying in a coma on life support with only the sound of a respirator. That God hears His church and God hears you. God, our Heavenly Father, hears you. Because the Holy Spirit is our advocate who speaks for us, who intercedes for us, who enters into our lives in ways that we cannot fathom. No, they're not often in ways that we can see. They're not often in ways that we can touch or feel or taste or smell. No, the way that God enters into our lives are in ways that change our hearts, that, change, that bring us through those dark and broken times. It is when the Spirit enters into our lives and He moves in us when all else is lost. He is there. And our God is listening. Even when we feel that we have no voice left to speak, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. And He lifts up those groans of our broken hearts. He lifts them before the Father. And the Father, He reaches down to His sons and daughters to each of you, and He mends those broken hearts. Paul says it so much better than I ever could. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, 
But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit hears your prayers because He is not a Spirit of word alone, but He is the Lord of action. He is the Lord who created faith in your hearts at, the very, at your very baptism. He is the Spirit who walks with you each and every day. The Spirit who sustains you. It is the Holy Spirit who is the one who gives us strength to believe. That even in our darkest times to know that He is not just then with us, but that He is always with us. To know that He is the one who points us to the hope of our salvation. And not just any hope but the hope and promise that we will be fully restored. Turn again to Romans 8 with me, and I encourage you to read this and print it out and put it on your refrigerator because this part is so important. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemptions of our bodies. For in this hope, for in this hope, we are saved. The redemption of our bodies, the redemption of all of creation. God doesn't just promise that He will make us disembodied spirits that will die and will go to heaven and will float around as angels or something like that. But He promises that in a physical way we will rise because He has risen. Because Jesus has conquered sin, death, and the devil. He has conquered the brokenness and the shame of our lives. And He has given us the promise that as He has risen, we too shall rise. It is true that we face many dark moments in this life. That at times that we are a people of words alone and not of action. But that is why we turn to our God, who is a God of action. Who did not merely speak the words of salvation, but gave, poured them out in His very blood. Who did not merely give us the promise of salvation, but shed His blood, sweat, and tears that we would be with Him forever. Dear people of God, this is the hope we have. Our God is a God of action. Our God is a God of salvation. And our God is the God who will give us new life in the new creation. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for sending your Holy Spirit we give thanks that even in the midst of our trials and our pains, that He comes before You as our Advocate, lifting up the groans of our hearts. We thank You, O Lord, that You, that you have sent Your Spirit, that not only in those times, but in the times of joy, that He gives us those words of praise to You. We thank You for the faith that He has sown in our hearts, for the joy and hope of the promise we have in You, Help us to live in this hope each day. To live in a hope of that we will one day rise with You. That as You hear the groanings of us, of Your creation, that You will one day restore each of us, body and soul. That as You have risen, we too shall rise. May this be our hope this day. And may this be our assurance every day. This we pray in the name of Jesus as led by the Holy Spirit. Amen.